Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have begotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel, your brother? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, and now you are cursed from the ground which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. To God. The epistle reading is from Ephesians chapter 2. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward, uh, toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Hallelujah, hallelujah. 
The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 18th chapter. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Jesus also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
mercy so that we might be saved eternally. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I think this is one of those mornings where we need extra grace. And thanks be to God, our lectionary has brought us a real gem. Today we hear the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And friends, this is one of my favorites. It's short, it's sweet, it's easy to understand, and it gets right to the heart of our faith. That is, it gets to the heart of justification. What makes a person acceptable before God? And as it turns out, the Pharisee was not acceptable to God. He wasn't justified while the tax collector was. Now that's not to say that everybody in the world fits neatly into the category of either Pharisee or tax collector. We could just as easily preach today on don't be like that, or don't let us say, like the Pharisee said of the tax collector, at least I'm not like the Pharisee over there. But people don't so easily fit into categories, not like this. But we can understand that by the word of God, we do know who is justified and who is not. Who, what, it makes to, to, what it takes to make a person acceptable before God or unacceptable before God, headed for heaven or headed for hell. And the Pharisee and the tax collector illustrate that difference at the very least. So let's take a look at this. Now first we notice who it is that Jesus tell this, tells this parable to and why. Text tells us he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Now that's a pretty good definition of what it means to be self-righteous, is it not? Self-righteous people, they trust in themselves. They trust that they are righteous and they despise other people who they see as not quite living up to their standards. We take this Pharisee. He goes to the temple in Jerusalem and he prays, and so does the tax collector. Right there, you see that most of the people in the world, they're already dismissed from this story. Salvation, justification, forgiveness, acceptance by the one and only true God, it's found in the temple of the true God. Not everyone who enters that temple, though, leaves forgiven. The tax collector did. The Pharisee didn't. But all who are to be forgiven must seek forgiveness in God's temple. And most of the people of the world, unfortunately, do not do that. Now, the temple of the true God, it used to be in Jerusalem. That's where God had commanded his house to be built until the coming of his son who took over as the true temple of God. And of course, his coming, him being the temple, it is foreshadowed by that Old Testament building, that place where God had located himself for his people. And he is now building his holy Christian church into a temple. He's building it into himself for salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that is given among men by which we must be saved. So already most of the world is excluded from this presence. As long as they remain outside of Christ, as long as they remain outside of his church, his temple, his assembly of the baptized, there can be no justification but God wants them to come in. God wants all men to find forgiveness. He wants all people to join him in his house. And we know from many places in scripture how he invites them, how he calls out to them, how he sends out the servants 
to the highways, to the hedges, to invite anyone who will come to the house of the Lord to feast at his banquet. But as long as they remain outside the temple, there can be no acceptable person before God. No matter how righteous they may think they are. But of those who do enter the temple, those that we find in the temple, we still see two kinds as we get back to today's parable. Pharisee stood in the temple, he prayed. And you may want to remember this parable when some non-church-going friend tells you he doesn't need to go to church because he prays to God every day. Well, the Pharisee prayed to God, and look where it got him. It got him nowhere. And this is what he prays. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust adulterers, or even this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. So not only does this Pharisee go to church, go into the temple, we see here he even lives a decent life. He's a pretty stand-up guy. He's no criminal. He's an honest man by our standards. He gives his offering, his tithe, his 10%, perhaps even above and beyond what God required in the law. Judging by his disdain for the tax collector, it might be true that he's paid his fair share of taxes. So he's a pretty clean-cut, good, upstanding gent. But the problem is, as you can see here, he trusted in himself that he was righteous. He would not humble himself and the result of this is that he despises his neighbor. He sees himself more worthy of God's favor than his neighbor. Like the Pharisee in the gospel, he worships God without knowledge. And how is that? How can one worship God wrongly? How is it that we misunderstand who God is, what he intends to do for us sinners? This Pharisee, he knows the scriptures well enough. In fact, he knows the scriptures better than most people do. He knew the history of the Old Testament, and he even believed it all happened. He knew the law of Moses, but he still knew God wrongly. How does that happen? because he missed the point of the law and he also missed the promise of the gospel. We think about Saul, like all the Pharisees, he knew the law of God, he tried to keep the law of God, he observed all the laws, tries to go above and beyond what God requires, but he missed the point. The law shuts our mouth before God. He would later write, by the law is the knowledge of sin. As a Pharisee, he was trying to make himself acceptable to God. That's self-righteousness. It's the misuse of the law. The law is holy. You can't live to its standard. It doesn't say do your best, give it your best try, try to obey. The law accuses everyone. We are all imperfect. It condemns every sinner to death. Cursed is everyone who does not continue in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. And Saul, the, like the Pharisee in this parable, he missed the point. He didn't understand what it means to be justified by faith. He couldn't grasp that reality that we heard in Ephesians today. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. The parable we hear today is a picture of what that looks like. 
the tax collector, and all other sinners in this world know that they must have God's grace in order to be saved. That we need not be like the Pharisee, self-righteous and self-confident in himself and his good works and him being the upstanding guy. We don't want to be like those who miss the promise of the gospel. That from the beginning, from the Garden of Eden, God had promised us a Savior. A Savior who would be both God and man. A Savior who would keep the law. A Savior who he himself would be the atoning sacrifice for sin. So before he becomes known as Paul, this Saul, this Pharisee, he finally learned and then preached, I declare to you the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received and in which you stand, by which also you are saved. If you hold fast that word which I preach to you, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That is the gospel. And the promise of the gospel, as Paul wrote, is that you are saved by it. If you hold fast to it, and you know what that means to hold fast to it, is to believe it, to have faith in it. For did Jesus not promise that he who believes and is baptized will be saved? That is a promise from God. The tax collector in this parable, he understood both the point of the law and the promise of the gospel. He was a tax collector, and that profession on its own is not a bad thing. Now, in its context, in the first century, they were seen more as like a mob goon more than anything. They're not like our IRS agents today. Save your thoughts about that. This tax collector, he knows, though, that he himself is a sinner. Very often, this was the profession that would be practiced in an evil way, and people didn't like tax collectors. They thought they were a bunch of thieves. And there are people in this world today that when their name comes to our mind or their profession comes to mind, we may think similarly. We all have an inner Pharisee. Let's not kid ourselves. This is why God gives us baptism, to drown the old Adam, to strive to a new virtue in Christ, being compelled not out of fear of the law, but out of joy for the gospel. But this tax collector, he doesn't make a list to God how hard he's trying to keep the commandments. He doesn't tell God about all of his good works. He doesn't try to excuse the bad ones. His confession before God, it's short and it's sweet. I'm a sinner. Literally, I am the sinner. Have mercy on me. His plea for God's mercy was a plea for God's favor. Not because he was a sinner, but because God had promised to be merciful to sinners. And he promised to show that mercy in his temple. We think about the book of Hebrews that says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness for sins. And where the blood was being shed according to the command of God, there the forgiveness of sins could be proclaimed. And there he stood. He had promised to forgive sins by means of those sacrifices offered on God's altar, which were always pointing ahead to the great sacrifice of Christ. The tax collector, he understood, and he believed what the psalmist had written. And you know these words. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. And as Jesus declared, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted You see how beautifully that epistle gospel 
That, that gospel we heard in the epistle and this parable we hear in our actual gospel reading today, how they fit so well together. This is what we stand on, not being saved by our good works, by all the wonderful things we think we have done, but to be saved by grace through faith for the sake of Christ alone. We have faith in God's promise of mercy and forgiveness. And we know that that price was paid for by Jesus, that it was offered to us for his sake. So we can mourn that there is no forgiveness for the self-righteous Pharisee, not because there was no sacrifice for his sins. Those sacrifices happening in the temple were for him too. But he claimed a righteousness of his own, a righteousness that comes by the law. But the forgiveness that is for the tax collector and the forgiveness that is there for all who will believe what the word says, that we are sinners, that we are saved by God's grace through Jesus Christ. Even as we preach Christ crucified, where blood was shed for our sins, where the eternal sacrifice for our fallen nature was made, for all who claim the righteousness and the sacrifice of Christ, the only mediator between God and man, as that once pharisaical apostle Paul, as he eventually learned and confessed to us, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the, the righteousness which is from God by faith. So friends, this parable calls to us today. It invites us to be a tax collector, to be the sinner who would humble himself before God and confess our transgressions of his law but also seeking forgiveness, trusting in the promises of God. And I tell you, this day you will go down to your house justified. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, be merciful to us. For daily and much do we sin and transgress your holy will. For the sake of the perfect life and the sacrificial death of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, forgive us our sins. Fill us with your Spirit that we would remain humble, never forgetting that we have been saved by grace through faith, which was not our doing, but your gracious gift. Lord, in your mercy, Be merciful to our neighbors, especially those who have sinned against us and done us harm. Give us patience and strength that we would deal with them gently and humbly, and that we would be ready to forgive as we have been forgiven. Lord, in your mercy, be merciful to your church, both here and in every place. Send forth faithful servants to deliver your grace and mercies to sinners in need. Defend all pastors from arrogance and pride and strengthen them in the faithful preaching of your word. That true unity in the faith would be found wherever Christ crucified is proclaimed. Lord, in your mercy. Be merciful to those who are unemployed or underemployed in our land that they would find gainful employment and bless all who labor, that they would find contentment and security in their work. Lord, in your mercy. Be merciful to our leaders, that they would exercise the authority given them with wisdom and righteousness so that we would be enabled to live in freedom and peace. Lord, in your mercy. Be merciful to all those in need, especially children who lack food, clothing, and shelter, and provide for their needs. Look in mercy also upon all orphans who are in need of parents to care for them. Provide them with fathers and mothers who will love and care for them as their own. Until such provision is realized, bless those who care for them, that they would do so in love, which is filled with mercy and compassion. Lord, in your mercy, be merciful to the sick and to the sorrowing, that they would receive not only temporal relief, but that in all times and places and under all circumstances, they would know the forgiveness of their sins and the hope of eternal life won for them in Christ Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, be merciful to those who come to the holy altar today that they would approach your throne of grace humbly and with reverence, and that they would receive the true body and blood of Christ in faith and for their highest good, being united in one holy fellowship with all your saints. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is sweet and right so to do. It is truly meet, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels 
and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Ghost as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end. Amen. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endureth forever. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Bless we the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Amen.